you know, there's people all across the spectrum on these issues. For some of you, it might be the very first time that you're thinking about these issues, uh, particularly with what's going on in the world politically, coronavirus, um, the whole, you know, um, riot thing that's going on in the States. And you're probably, you know, wanting to get your, your, your dip your toe in the water on this subject. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do here over the next uh, 40, 40 minutes or so. So let's jump right in. What is asset protection? I really love this, this visual because you can see the, the big castle with the, you know, the field and the trees around it, followed by uh, a wall and followed by uh, water. And you can imagine how hard it would be, you know, to get in an unnoticed way to that house. And let's say you were trying to burglarize it. Uh, it certainly would not be the low-hanging fruit. So what is asset protection? The simple answer is protect what is yours, okay? Um, lots of other people want to talk about, um, you know, making money, um, how you can, whoops, I'm going, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, let's see, let me get back, backward. Maybe Joe, you can help me. I don't know. There we go. There's some backward. Uh, Ivan told me that I might, I uh, have a, a, a trigger finger that's a little bit too fast here. Sorry about that. So anyways, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that, that can, um, comprise asset protection. And so for some people, it could be a very complex structure, could be, you know, trusts and foundations layered with corporations. And, you know, it can go on and on and on in multiple jurisdictions. But for some people, you know, just taking your 16 year old daughter's credit card away from her, that's asset protection as well, right? So it's different for everybody, depending on your risk profile, your family, uh, what are the threats that you perceive um, are all your assets invested in dollars versus, you know, maybe a, a broader basket of investments. So everybody has a different take on, on what is asset protection. Uh, but let me also start by saying what asset protection is not. And uh, frequently when I speak at conferences, particularly offshore conferences that are held in, you know, let's say zero tax havens, you know, people want to come up to me and say, well, you know, can you tell me how to do it so that I can, you know, not pay any taxes? And that's not really the right way to view asset protection. There's no magic fairy dust that I can sprinkle over your assets, regardless of where you move them, particularly for Americans. You know, the U.S. government taxes you based on your citizenship, not based on where you live. Most other countries tax you based on where you live. So if you're a German, but you don't live in Germany, you don't pay German taxes. In the US, that's not the case. They tax you on your worldwide income. Doesn't matter whether you live in, you know, in uh, Pennsylvania, where I live, or, or in, uh, in Germany or Singapore, the US government is, you know, is going to tax you. So I want to emphasize that asset protection is not a scheme to evade taxes, okay? I don't think anybody on the call here would, would look good wearing one of these orange jumpsuits. I like the orange sunset behind Joe better. It looks, uh, it's a much better color orange. Okay, so again, it's, it's not about evading taxes, but even still a lot of people come to me and they have this idea that, you know, what we're doing is we're playing a game of hide and seek. You know, we're trying to just hide these assets and, and nobody's gonna find them. That's kind of their, their initial mentality. Um, but sort of like these children here, uh, they think, that you can't see them because their eyes are covered, right? That's the, way, that's the way asset protection planning is. I mean, we live in a very, very transparent world. Um, if you were to go into your bank in Pittsburgh or Cleveland or Houston or, or Miami, it doesn't matter where, um, and you were to transfer money offshore, the wire transfer at the exact same moment that it's sending your money to a foreign bank is also sending notice of that transfer to the U.S. government, to the U.S. Treasury. So that's the bank's obligation to do that. There are other times uh, that you have to do that yourself. There's an, something called the annual FBAR, Foreign Bank Account Report. You have to file that every year. But even if you don't file it, the bank's already filed it the minute you sent the money. So it's kind of like these kids thinking you can't see them because their eyes are covered um, we just live in way too much of a, a transparent world. So um, I like to think of it as a, as a different uh, children's game. It's, it's really more about show and tell. 
It's, you know, here's what I've done. This is perfectly legal. It's perfectly moral. It's perfectly ethical. And uh, I've structured my assets in such a way to make it very difficult for, you know, would-be creditors to come and take them, uh, maybe to uh, ensure that my assets after my death uh, are administered and distributed the way I want, to whom I want, um, you know, and it's not, there's not going to be uh, uh, a big probate fight going on between heirs as to, you know, how they think uh, my assets should be divided up. So it's, it's really about showing and tell. It's letting people know, this is what I've done. It's legal, it's moral, it's ethical. And I'll just give a little quick story to drive this point home maybe a little bit better. When I was first starting out, I was probably just not much older than, than Joe is now. Uh, I was one of my first uh, law clients and uh, we were setting up a, a trust that happened to be in Belize. This would have been in the early 90s. And um, the particular client was a physician. Um, we set up a, he sold his practice to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, his, uh, you know, his, his personal medical practice. And uh, that was sort of his exit strategy. And UPMC paid him about $3 million for his practice. Uh, he paid almost $800,000 in all different types of taxes, ordinary income and capital gains taxes, and depreciation, uh, recapture, and things like that. But when all was said and done, about $2.2 million went to, into a trust for his children and grandchildren uh, that we set up offshore for him. And about, I don't know, six months, eight months later, um, his former nurse brought a whistleblower case against him alleging that he had defrauded Medicaid and Medicare and um, basically uh, trying to recover damages. The problem with that kind of litigation is if you really defraud the U.S. government, it's not just a civil matter, it's a criminal matter. And in fact, in this case, uh, it, it precipitated a criminal investigation. And the criminal investigation honestly didn't last that long. And uh, it basically was thrown out because there was no evidence. Uh, and the judge uh, actually uh, apologized to my court, my client, saying, "You know, we we should never have put you through this uh, because the, you know, the the prosecutors never really supplied any reasonable uh, evidence to to make their case." So that was thrown out. Now you're going to say, "Well, if the if the criminal case was thrown out, the civil case should have been thrown out as well." Uh, but unfortunately, that's not how our legal system works. In fact, just the opposite. Everybody is uh, given their day in court. And, uh, you know, and so the civil case proceeded. And, it, you know, there were a lot of interrogatories. And finally, there was uh, a deposition. And for the non lawyers in the audience, the deposition is something whereby, you know, you're, you have a court reporter, uh, but you're not in a court. Uh, you're in, you know, a, a law firm office, usually sitting around a board table. And, um, you know, we were having, basically, they were interviewing my client and they were asking him, you know, where he was from and uh, where he went to medical school and how long he practiced. And then they came to the one question that they really wanted to know. And that question was, hey, doctor, we see that, um, you know, you sold your practice for about $3 million. What happened to the money? Okay. In comes show and tell. We we weren't hiding. We weren't pretending that he didn't get any money or that he lost the money in a casino in Vegas or something like that. So no, I I transferred the money to an offshore trust, and here's a copy of that trust. Here's a business card of the trustee. You can certainly contact him to verify that the you know trust is in existence, and um, you know that's that's what he had to say and. And you could tell from the whispers and the murmurs across the table that uh, the lawyers, they asked if they could take a short recess and they went out in the hall with their client. And when they came back, they basically said, look, we're going to have to take a, um, you know, a recess on this. Um, we're going to have to adjourn for today and we'll get back to you um, on how we're going to proceed. And a few weeks later, we got a, a notice that the plaintiffs had voluntarily um, you know, drop the case. And I spoke to one of the attorneys. He, he wouldn't exactly, you know, betray his attorney client privilege, but I was able to kind of discern what happened in that five minute conversation out in the hall. They went out with the nurse and they said, look, nurse, we 
where you think you have a really good case, uh, but you know this these assets are now domiciled in another jurisdiction. It's going to be very hard to go after them. Uh, we're more than willing to continue to represent you, uh, but we can no longer do it on a contingency fee basis. We need to uh, charge X amount of dollars. And um, the nurse said, well, wait a minute, what happened to, you know, no fee unless you get money for me? And um, she basically threw in the towel and went away. So it wasn't because we were hiding. It was because we were willing to show and tell. We had done everything correctly and legally. Uh, we we're saying if, if you're going to uh, come after us, we've decided the jurisdiction that you're going to have to do that in. You can sue us in Pennsylvania all you want, but there's no assets here. So now you have to go to Belize and you have to go under the Belize rules. You have to file a suit in Belize and hope that you know you get somewhere with that case. It's going to be much, much harder. So again, you're not the low-hanging fruit. Okay. So I, I, as an asset protection lawyer, I really love the book, The Art of War, written by a famous Chinese general, Sun Tzu, about 2,500 years ago. And in that book, there are a number of quotes that that I think really apply. Of course, they apply to warfare, but in a sense, asset protection planning is planning for warfare. It's just a different kind of warfare, right? It's it's uh, uh, warfare with pens and paper and lawyers and bankers and uh, things like that. It's not, you know, swords and, and guns. So Sun Tzu said in the Art of War, "quote The prevention of defeat lies in our own hands. Hence, the skillful fighter puts himself in a position." that makes defeat impossible, okay? So before he worried about trying to win the war, he wanted to make sure that he could not lose the war. And I think that's a really, really important thing. I, I get clients all the time, they're, they're so focused on, you know, what their investments are. You know, I, I, I view the investment side as the offense. That's what you do with your money, how you're gonna grow your money. That's all great, everybody needs offense. But, you know, famous Bear Bryant once said, um, with a great offense, you, you, you will win some games, but with a great defense, you'll win championships. And that's what we're really talking about. We're trying, asset protection and planning is the defense. You know, I'm not here to tell you how to invest your money. I'm here to tell you how to protect your money so that nobody can take it away from you. And then from there, you can invest it yourself or you can work with trustees, investment advisors, asset managers, uh, invest in companies like ECI, I mean, that's your business. I'm really making sure that your defense is shorn up. Okay, let's uh, keep moving along here. So that sort of is the end of my question one, which is what is asset protection? Why do we do it? Now I wanna talk a little bit about what risks are we protecting ourselves from? And I've divided the universe of those risks down into four groups. First, we have physical risks. Now, nobody really likes talking about physical risks, but you know, in the last couple of months on television, um, whether you want to talk, whether you, whether you want to refer to them as peaceful protests, like one of the networks, or as just outright riots, you can see that you know, protecting yourself physically, protecting your your the physical aspect of your assets has never been more important. So, you know, where you live, where you work, where you send your children to school, you know, where you vacation where you're sitting right now for this, for this webinar, quite frankly, uh, takes into account things like physical risks. And uh, again, I, I think um, you have people that are asking themselves questions like, hey, is the government going to protect me? Is the government going to protect my physical property? And we see in some places like New York City and Portland and you know, other places around the country, Chicago, um, the government has not protected people's property. They've stood aside while while property and, and in some cases, you know, people's lives were lost because law enforcement was not there uh, to protect them. So making decisions about where you live and work and where you're going to retire and where you're going to domicile your assets, you know, physical risks, ha you know, has always been there, but I think it's more important now than ever. Secondly, we have economic risks. And, um, you know, particularly for my American clients, it's, it's really hard to, for them to get their head around this concept because most people think, well, if I'm diversified in my investments and I have stocks and bonds and mutual funds, maybe a little real estate, you know, I'm, I'm well diversified and your investment advisor is going to tell you that. But that's, that's diversification within a basket 
which happens to be the US dollar basket. So if your assets in that dollar basket are going up, but the value of the dollar is going down, well, what's happening? You think you're making money. In fact, <laughs> you're obligated to pay tax on the money that you think you're making. Uh, but the reality is you're, you're not making money from the perspective of your purchasing power. So for example, most people you know, would say, oh, wow, in the last couple of months, we've really seen gold spike and, and, and it's gone way up. Okay, I'm not a gold bug, but I think you can, we can all agree that gold is something that governments cannot produce. They can't just press buttons and, and, you know, and print it overnight like they can dollars, right? So if we use gold as the measuring stick rather than the dollar as the measuring stick, what we'll find is that the dollar has basically gone down uh, dramatically. If we wanna um, look, for example, over the last 100 years, 100 years ago, a man's suit could be purchased for about $25, which was the price of one ounce of gold. Now, fast forward 100 years later, you, know, you could go out and buy a nicely tailored man's suit for $2,000, uh, but it's still, one ounce of gold. So did gold really go up in value or did the dollar go down in value? I think, you know, you can make a good case it's the latter. And uh, the, the famous French philosopher Voltaire uh, famously said that all paper currency will eventually reach its intrinsic value and that value is zero. So it's just a question of, you know, how long it takes to get there. And uh, in the little batch of currency, sometimes at conferences I like to bring you know, notes like the hundred trillion uh, Z uh, Zimbabwean dollar, or you know, the the hundred billion uh, German uh, rice mark uh, from the 1920s, things like that. You can see that you know, as the money has gone down in value, people have used larger and larger numbers uh, to try to offset that. And I think that's what we're really that's really what's happening now. It's it's being masked to a certain extent for a couple of reasons. One, the dollar is still considered to be the world reserve currency, you have things like uh, worldwide oil sales are conducted in dollars. You have people that are in much worse countries than the US. Believe me, if you were Venezuelan right now, you would much rather have dollars than, than your own Venezuelan peso, right? So you have this demand that's soaking up all of these excess trillions and trillions of dollars that the Federal Reserve uh, is printing. But at some point, um, you know, it, it, it's not just the number of dollars in circulation, but the velocity at which those dollars passes from one person to the next, to the next, to the next. So while the production of dollars themselves has gone way up, the velocity has gone way down. And it's a, it's a you know, it's a multiplication factor. So, you know, right now the overall effect is, is um, nominal. But when spending starts picking up with all these excess of trillions and trillions of dollars that have just been printed overnight, uh, you're going to see inflation, you're going to see hyperinflation. Um, and, and I think that's what people are worried about. So, you know, when we talk about economic risks, we're talking about true global diversification, not just stocks and bonds and mutual funds, but what about different currencies? What about non-currency uh, assets, whether it's gold, silver, you know, uh, Bitcoin, you know, the, I hosted a presentation uh, a few weeks back on Bitcoin, and I'm I'm sort of a recent convert to the concept. Like, you know, I know Joe has been in love with it for a long time. A lot of my clients, um, I always thought it was this, you know, funny funny stuff created by some some guys on a computer. Uh, but the reality is, the number of Bitcoin is finite, and because it's finite, the value can only go up as demand increases. The price will increase. Whereas with dollars, you know, the, there is demand for dollars, but we keep printing more and more and more of them. So it's li literally the supply is infinite uh, or virtually infinite, which is going to make the, the, the value per unit go down over time. That's just economics 101. So I didn't mean to get caught up too much on the economic risk, but they're really important. I think people right now maybe have more worries about this than even some of the other risks that we're going to talk about. That's why you see people saying, hey, I've got this excess wealth, my stock market portfolio is way up. Um, everything I have seems to be doing great. Maybe this is the time to take some of my profits, pull out um, you know, of dollars and move into other currencies or into hard assets, you know, like uh, 
an ECI property, for example. All right, so after economic risks, we have taxation risks. And, um, you know, I think most of you on this call probably have some form of um, tax diversified planning that you work with, whether it's IRA or 401k, SARSEP, KEO, life insurance, annuities. Why do we do those things? Well, we know inherently that if we can defer when we pay tax, uh, that, our, that our money is gonna grow faster, right? Somebody once asked Albert Einstein, what's the strongest force in the universe? And his response was compound interest. So, you know, you can do some, you know, formulas to see that most, most investment advisors will show you graphs and charts to show you how much faster money grows when it's inside a, an IRA, for example, than when it's outside an IRA. And if you're trying to diversify offshore, for example, there's nothing stopping you from investing from your IRA into things like offshore real estate. Uh, there's no prohibition on that. You just have to find a custodian, a U.S. custodian that will allow you to do that. And the typical, uh, you know, Charles Schwab's and Fidelities, they're not going to let you do that. But, you know, we work with about a dozen firms around the country that specifically specialize in that kind of, um, in that kind of structure. Uh, they make sure that you're compliant with the IRS and all of the reporting requirements and obligations. Uh, the money moves offshore. You can invest in, in pretty much anything you want, uh, um, but it has to be for investment, right? You can't buy a property and go live in it and things like that. But if it's a true investment, you know, you can certainly do it. So minimizing, avoiding, deferring uh, our tax obligations uh, is certainly one of the most important things that we look at uh, from an asset protection standpoint. All right, and then the last risk is basically litigation risk. Now we all hate the, the taxation, I mean, we all hate the taxation risk because we feel like that's what government does to us, uh, but the litigation risk, you know, that's what we do to each other. Um, that's not normally the government bringing litigation, although it could be. Um, it's, uh, you know, the lawsuits that are filed about every seven seconds of every minute of every hour of every day in the United States. Uh, we live truly in the most litigious um, country in the world. Uh, the vast majority of wealth is held by about 6% of American households, which means though that 6% are in, you know, essentially always the defendants. You know, it's, it's unlikely that that you're gonna to wanna to bring a lawsuit, a meaningful lawsuit against somebody that's in the 94% the of the have nots. You're gonna have, you know, litigation's gonna be brought against people like you on this call. If you have assets, you're worried about them, then you are gonna be a litigation target, whether it's because of your you know, profession, you're a doctor, or a lawyer, or a financial advisor, There's so many things that can go wrong. And uh, you know, when everything doesn't work out the way people think it should, they're gonna find a reason to sue you. So you know, at, you know, asset protection planning is really about pre-litigation planning. And if we do our planning correctly, create the right structures, put them in the right jurisdictions, what we're essentially doing is we're jurisdiction shopping to make sure that our assets are located in the jurisdictions that are the most friendly, that are where it's the hardest to, you know, pierce those corporate and trust structures and go after that assets. So while my firm has worked literally all over the world in all different types of structures, there's a, probably about a half dozen countries that rise to the top as being you know, the strongest from an asset protection standpoint. So we have countries like Panama, for example, uh, Belize, uh, the Cook Islands, Liechtenstein in Europe, Switzerland, um, Singapore. Um, you know, these are the types of countries that we tend to create structures in because again, we're jurisdiction shopping for places where you're gonna have the upper hand if you have to defend yourself. In many, in many instances, I would say in Belize and the Cook Islands, specifically those two jurisdictions, uh, in many cases, there's a statutory bar about even bringing uh, litigation against a, an asset protection trust created in that jurisdiction. So once I move the funds there and create the right kind of legal structure, you know, you don't have to worry about being sued anymore, which is, you know, for a lot of people, they can sleep a lot better at night because they don't have to worry about that. All right. So those are the first two questions. Um, I guess, you know, 
the real question is, do we have a level playing field? I think the answer is no, we don't. Uh, in the US, we have a pro plaintive system. Um, we have a, you know, basically blackmail, green mail system where, you know, the nuisance value of settling a lawsuit is around $50,000 or more. And, um, you know, plaintiff lawyers understand that. We have a contingency uh, based system. So it's, it's in the interest of a lot of uh, litigation firms to just crank out, you know, lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit to, you know, settle as many as possible, take a few to court, um, and more and more defendants and insurance companies are, are settling. Uh, but by doing that, we're driving the cost of everything higher. You know, I'm sure there's a certain element when you stop by the McDonald's and buy a cup of coffee, you know, that, that coffee costs more now because a jury decided to give, you know, a plaintiff $2 million, um, you know, um, uh, award for them spilling their own coffee in their lap because they said McDonald's made the coffee too hot. Okay. So, you know, it sounds great uh, for that person that got the 2 million, uh, but we all pay for it. And th the excess costs of litigation find their way into everything. Uh, every product, every consumer product you buy, every service that you buy, medical uh, costs now. I, I just read something recently that um, when, when you buy any kind of medical cost, any kind of medical service, that basically about half of that cost is associated with the uh, administrative and legal aspects of administering healthcare and not the actual healthcare itself. So we've gotten to the point now where we're paying the lawyers, the MBAs, the administrators, the PPOs, the HMOs, we're paying all of that, all, the, all of that organizational stuff, we're paying them more than the actual doctors and nurses that are performing uh, the actual health service. So uh, again, litigation is driving up all of those costs. And so we don't have a level playing field. All right, so why international asset protection? Well, here's a couple of quick things I'll just mention. First, no recognition of US judgments. What does that mean? That means if somebody sues you in your home state and they get a judgment against you, and then they take that judgment to one of the jurisdictions I just mentioned, like Belize or like the Cook Islands, and they say, hey, court, we've got this judgment. Uh, we'd like you to enforce it for us. The foreign court is not going to do that. Now, in the U.S., you know, the various state courts will do that. So if, if, if somebody sues you in Pennsylvania and they get a, you know, a judgment against you and they find out you have assets in Texas, they can bring that Pennsylvania judgment to Texas. They don't have to relitigate the, the case. They just, you know, bring the, the judgment and a, and, a Cal, and a Texas court will enforce that judgment. A foreign, uh, a foreign court and a foreign judge will not. Secondly, a bright line test. What does that mean? That means that a lot of jurisdictions, like again, the ones I've mentioned, you know, it's, it's a very straightforward analysis. And that analysis can be as simple as what came first, the creation of the legal structure or the, uh, or the lawsuit. You know, if my, if my trust in the Cook Islands is dated one day before your lawsuit, well, then the plaintiff's out of luck. They're not going to be, after, be able to go after those assets at all. If, if it came one day after, in other words, if the lawsuit came first and then you ran out and set up a trust, well, you may have some problems. You get into uh, some concepts called the statute of frauds. But again, some jurisdictions have eliminated the concept of statute of frauds. Um, and then other jurisdictions, Nevis is a good example. They have bond requirements. So if you want to sue me, you can, but you have to place a bond with the court uh, in, in, the, in, a, in a similar amount to the amount you're suing me for. And if I'm the defendant and I win, then the court's going to use that bond to, to pay me, to reimburse me for my legal costs. So um, yes, you can still bring lawsuits in those types of jurisdictions, uh, but you know, it's like the UK loser pay system. And, um, you know, that's really more of a neutral um, system because it doesn't discourage litigation, but it uh, makes sure that uh, whoever loses pays the legal cost of the winner. Uh, I think that would be a very good thing to have in the States, but, but uh, there's a, a huge lobby against that, right? All right. So next, we're going to talk about what are the benefits of international asset protection planning. 
Uh, as Joe mentioned, we're sitting here in, in, in Pittsburgh, and I always like to, to work a, a slide in uh, one of the, the Pittsburgh sports teams. Uh, and we're talking about asset protection. So football is a great uh, analogy. That's a picture of the famous steel curtain defense of the 1970s, not the more, um, you know, more recent teams, which also have great defenses, but the, the Pittsburgh steel curtain defense was, was legendary. Um, this particular picture happens to be from Super Bowl IX. Uh, I don't think anybody would want to be that poor Minnesota Vikings uh, ball carrier. Um, and, and just as an aside, the uh, score of, this, of, of Super Bowl IX, that's when that picture was taken, uh, the score at halftime was still, was then and is still the lowest halftime score in, in uh, Super Bowl history. The score was Pittsburgh two, Minnesota nothing. And of course, how do you get two points in, in football? You get it with the safety. So, um, you know, we, we had at that time only a very mediocre offense. The offense in the years that followed became a, an exceptional great offense. And that's how Pittsburgh won six Super Bowls. Uh, but right then, the very first one, Super Bowl nine, we had an exceptional defense. Um, and, um, you know, that's really what we're trying to do with asset protection planning. We want to create an exceptional defense and uh, I'll, I'll leave it to others. In fact, even for my, for my own investments, I'm more than happy to defer to the wisdom of others because that's what they do for a living. Asset protection planning is what I do for a living. So I'm constantly looking for the best ways, the best jurisdictions to give you the best benefit, depending on what you need you know, as a client. All right, so we talked about um, the jurisdiction benefits, then we have the tax benefits. And uh, quite honestly, this particular slide needs to be updated because that foreign earned income exclusion now is $107,000. Uh, so I apologize for that. But the, the notion is that, again, if, if you can conduct your life lifestyle in such a way that you're gonna save taxes, um, well, that's, uh, you know, that's a benefit. And if you live and work outside the United States, you can qualify for this particular section of the Internal Revenue Code, uh, which refers to the foreign earned income exclusion. And what that means is you do not pay tax on the first $107,000 plus a, an, an additional exemption amount for your housing when you live outside the country. So that, that, the total number now is almost $125,000. The 107,000 is per person. The housing exclusion is per, per married couple or family. So when it's all said and done, you know, a, a married couple can end up with almost just under a quarter million dollars in tax exempt income. And that makes, you know, a lot of sense. I mean, all that money that you're saving by living abroad uh, can pay for a lot of trips home to visit your grandkids or to help you start a business or, you know, whatever it, what it is you wanna do or you know, just slow down the amount you're consuming of your assets and make them last longer. So um, you know, there's other ways you can make your assets last longer too, right? You could move to a place in Central America where you can have a very high quality of your life for less money. Uh, but you know, here's a section of the tax code that says if you do this the right way, you're going to save taxes. So you know, what's what's a tax-free quarter million dollar? Um, income worth to you. I mean, that's, I don't, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but, you know, if you were in the 33% bracket, you'd be talking about, you know, saving $83,000 in, you know, in taxes. So tax benefits are real for people who live and work, you know, outside the U.S. Um, again, the U.S. taxes you on your worldwide income, but if you qualify for these benefits, you can eliminate the tax on that first $107,000 per person. All right, then we have privacy benefits. And, um, you know, we, we you know, I mentioned before show and tell, but, but that's really more show and tell when you need to show and tell, right? You need to, you know, prove to a plaintiff's attorney that your assets are, you know, domiciled offshore. You need to, you know, show the government in a lot of cases where your money is based. You have things you have to file like the foreign bank account reports and uh, filings for offshore trusts and offshore companies and things like that. Um, those types of transparency, you know, obviously you have to comply with the law, but when it comes to everybody else, I'm talking about, you know, disgruntled, um, 
you know, ex spouses or, um, you know, ex business partners, all the exes that you can imagine, um, you don't have an obligation to tell them where all your assets and your money is. So privacy is very important. So we've got corporate secrecy laws in some jurisdictions, we've got trust and foundation laws, where it's not public information, you know, who's created these uh, types of uh, legal instruments or who the beneficiaries are. So if you want to create uh, an asset protection trust for your, you know, for your children, for you know, grandchildren, and give it a fictitious name, nobody needs to know that you're the person that set up the trust or that they're the recipients. All right, and then we have estate benefits. And I think, you know, in addition to the issues I have up on the screen, I think there's a very, very important issue that I wanna mention on, the, on estate benefit planning right now. And that is that, you know, when the, when the Trump tax cuts went through a few years ago, one of the things they did was they doubled the lifetime exclusion amount, meaning the amount that you could give away during your life or at your death, whether it's to individuals, whether it's to something like an asset protection trust. And that amount was, was doubled to, well, now it's about $11.5 million per person, okay? So that means about $23 million per married couple. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is that when that exemption amount was increased, there was a sunset built into that law that brought it back down to the former, it's about 5.5, now it's about you know, 5.75 uh, million. It, it, it'll revert back to that number in uh, January, 2026. So that means, you know, in the best case scenario, you have about five years. Uh, but a lot of people think that that will be one of the, you know, pieces of low hanging fruit that a, um, particularly if a democratic government comes in, uh, they'll be looking for other sources of revenues and eliminating that uh, federal exemption amount for gifts and estate tax. You know, that's been a political football for as long as I've been practicing. So, you know, you have people like Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders saying, hey, this is a giveaway to the rich. You have people, you know, on the conservative side saying, hey, you know, it protects small family business, family farms, uh, because if you don't have these exemptions, first of all, you know, your estate is comprised of after-tax dollars to begin with. So that means this is money that you've saved and invested over your lifetime after you paid taxes. So a lot, that's the argument why there shouldn't be any estate tax. Um, and, and so there, this is a political football. In my 30 plus years, I've seen the exemption amount be zero, meaning the very first dollar was subject to gift and estate tax. And I've seen the amount happen one time in 2010 uh, be unlimited. So if you happen to be George Steinbrenner and you own the New York Yankees and you died in that year, you were able to leave a $2 billion at the time baseball franchise to your children without paying one cent of gift and estate tax. Um, but every other year, you know, except the time that it was zero and the time that it was unlimited, you know, it's been some number that for the most part has ranged between one and $3 million. Um, at, um, the um, negotiations between President Obama and the Senate Republicans in 2011 brought about this $5 million number. And a lot of people said that was because the average net worth of a U.S. Senator was $5 million. And that's how they came up with that number. I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good story and I'm, I'm sticking to it. Then President Trump doubled that amount. Plus there's been, um, it was indexed for inflation. So that's how we ended up at 11.5 million. I would say other than the year that it was, um, you know, that it was unlimited 2010, we're now at the very far edge of where I think the uh, exemption amount can go. And what that means is there's only one way for it to go and that's back, the pendulum's gonna swing back the other way. So a lot of people are, are looking now to create these types of structures to gift you know, a certain amount of money that they feel comfortable with. In some cases, it's up to their whole exemption amount. If you are fortunate to have that much money, um, you, know, you can move up to $23 million uh, to a trust, if you don't have $23 million, you only have $5 million, you know, you can move that amount. And if the later in 2021 or, or 2025 or 2026, whenever the exemption amount decreases or goes away, you know, you'll be fine because the tax consequences accrue at the moment that you do the transfer. So if you do the transfer in 2020, 
the tax consequences accrue in 2020, right now those tax consequences would be zero, and then you don't have to worry about it in 2021. So I didn't mean to go off on a tangent, but I think that's really important. It's very timely based on where we are. Um, you can see some of the other benefits offshore, like elimination of the rule against perpetuities, meaning you can leave assets in a trust for forever. You can leave, create what's called a dynasty trust and have a trust go on for many, many generations. Particularly if you have a, like a, a beautiful estate. I just read about a, 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 a vineyard estate in France that um, is being operated by a family now for 18 generations. So imagine um, that happening in the States. It would be virtually impossible. It's hard enough to get things to go one generation or two generations uh, from the founder of, of companies and, and um, the holder of assets. But to imagine them staying intact 18 generations, that's, that's just incredible. So these jurisdictions are designed to give you maximum control from beyond the grave. That means you can decide you know, who gets what, where, when, and how, basically forever. You can decide, you know, people get money for school or they don't, or they get money for to help uh, with a business or they don't, or they have to pay the money back or they don't. I mean, you can really decide how you want your estate to work. Um, if we had more time, I could talk more about uh, life insurance. It's still one of the best ways to, to grow wealth, both onshore and offshore, in tax-deferred ways. And insurance is a, is a pretty interesting perk because it can grow tax-deferred and then it comes out tax-free. And there are very few ways that you can grow an asset tax-deferred and have it come out tax-free. Life insurance is one of them. Of course, for it to work, you have to die. So it's, it's not the right kind of planning for everyone, but for those who are really looking for true generational wealth uh, transfer, you know, life insurance is still used by, by wealthy folks. All right, and then avoiding probate and forced airship rules. So I think I'm getting kind of low on time. I think this is going to be the last slide I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about right now, Joe. Um, maybe another time I can come back and talk about the story of two kings if if people want. Um, it's really about the examples about great planning and terrible planning. But before I turn the um, controls back to you, I just want to mention some of the most common structures and strategies that I think your audience would like to know about. I've mentioned a few times trusts. We have revocable and irrevocable. A, a revocable trust is not really an asset protection vehicle at all because by, by its name, it's revocable. It's usually just set up to help uh, people avoid probate, uh, can be a way to you know, keep the spotlight off your assets at, after your death. Uh, but it's not, if somebody sues you, it's not really gonna protect you um, or, or you know, taking advantage of the lifetime exclusion amount as I was just talking about a little bit ago. So trust, revocable, irrevocable, foundations, you know, we have private interest foundations. We have in the Germanic countries, we have things called Anstalts, which come out of Liechtenstein and are very interesting uh, vehicles. And they're really designed to mirror to a certain extent, the benefits of trust from a common law jurisdiction, but in a civil law system. Napoleon, a couple hundred years ago, when he was literally writing the French civil um, code, uh, it's, that's why it's called the Napoleonic Code, not, not just because it was written during his tenure, but he actually wrote it himself, which a lot of people don't realize. Uh, but he didn't like the way trusts worked. And, uh, and so he basically forbade the use of trusts in the Napoleonic Code. And so it took another hundred years for the civil law to come up with foundations. And now, you know, they, in 90% of the times they can they can mirror each other how they work. They're just in different systems. Then we have companies. People know that companies protect you from the actions of your company. But a lot of people have the misnomer that a company you know, protects you and your assets, and, it, and actually it does not. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like a shield that you can hold out in front of you. And when the inbound, incoming arrows are, are coming, you can block those arrows with your corporate shield. But if somebody can sue you, for some other reason, and they get a judgment against you, then your corporate assets, you know, that's just one more asset you hold. And it doesn't matter whether it's onshore or offshore. You know, if somebody gets a, a judgment against you and you own a, a company in Nevis, um, you know, they're just going to, or the judge is going to order you to turn over that company and all of its assets to the plaintiff if, if they get a judgment against you. So you have to, you have to know which types of structures need to be used in which, um, in which situation. 
Insurance we talked about and the benefits of that. Um, people always want to know about, well, what are non-reportable foreign assets? Meaning, what kind of assets can I put offshore that I don't have to report And that to the government? And that list is, you know, it used to be pretty wide and now it's pretty narrow. And I think we're down to, you know, just the last couple of things. Uh, one, uh, in the precious metal complex, if you own gold, silver, you know, platinum, palladium, you own that in your own name in bullion form, not in ETFs, not in, you know, Perth Mint certificates, not in anything like that. But you actually have a vault facility, let's say in Switzerland, and you've got your, you know, your gold bars stacked up. That That's not currently required to be reported as a foreign asset. Why is that? I have no idea. Maybe, you know, some high level IRS agent has all his money and, you know, gold bullion in Switzerland, he doesn't want to report it. But, you know, you can go literally to the IRS's own website. And uh, if you, um, go to the section on foreign bank account reports, the FBAR, there's a whole series of Q and A's about what is uh, reportable and what's not, and precious metals is not. The second thing, which I think leads me, you know, closely into probably some of the presentation Mike Cobb is gonna give, uh, has to do with real estate. Real estate is not considered to be a, a foreign financial asset. It's a foreign asset, but it's not a foreign financial asset. And so if you own a, you know, a beach lot in Belize or an apartment building in Paris, the fact that you own that, if you own that in your own name, that is not reportable. If you own it in, in certain kinds of structures, the existence of the structure is reportable, but the um, reporting on the existence of the property itself is not reportable. A lot of people want to know that. Then, you know, foreign residency, foreign citizenship, you know, it used to just be the one wacky guy in the back of the room that wanted to talk about that. You know, 15, 20 years ago. Now it's very, very mainstream. And, and I would say in the last six months, eight months, it's really risen to the top. A lot of people don't realize that the US passport was one of the best passports in the world, you know, at the beginning of, of 2020. Um, and you could travel visa free to 185 countries or so out of the 200 plus countries that there are in the world. And now uh, you can travel with that same US passport to 26 countries. Um, without uh, visas. And, you know, Europe, for example, is closed to American passports and things like that. So you have people looking to supplement their U.S. passport with the foreign residency, you know, programs like the Portuguese um, uh, Golden Visa. If you're interested in trying to get access back into Europe, um, you have investor visas in places like Belize, um, Friendly Nation Visa in Panama, very easy to get. Uh, you can talk to Joe about the, the Teak product that they have, which can qualify you for that. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can, without it costing you a fortune. There are programs that do cost a fortune. You know, if you, wanna, if you want citizenship in Cyprus, it just requires $2.2 .2 million and, and you're in. Uh, but other countries, it's, it's much cheaper. Some of the Caribbean passports can be had pretty quickly. St. Lucia, for example, right now has a, a coronavirus bond citizenship bond uh, that's discounted. There's some other specials in the, in the marketplace. We're going to talk about things like that at the, at the uh, conference in Vegas. And then lastly, I mentioned here common structures and strategies. And I just want to mention debt. Debt is a very important strategy. It's not a structure, but it is a strategy. And it's a particularly useful strategy uh, as it relates to real estate, real property. You know, you can't pick up real property in Minnesota and move it to an offshore trust, right? But what you can do is you can strip out the equity by borrowing against that equity from a bank. Right now we have, you know, record low interest rates. You can borrow that money. You can transfer that money offshore and put it in something like an asset protection trust. That trust can do whatever you want with the money, including get a very conservative CD from a bank. Um, and the interest from your CD will offset your, um, borrowing costs in the states. But what you've essentially done is you've made that asset completely uninteresting to a would-be creditor. So, you know, if they see that you've got this half million dollar property, but there's 440 or $50,000 in debt on it, um, they know that, you know, even if they get a judgment against you and it gets pushed into a share of sale, um, that the, you know, property is probably not going to produce more than the debt, meaning, you know, the bank's not going to lose its first position. So, you know, the bank's going to take the, the 450 and if there's something left over, they might get some crumbs, but probably not. 
Meanwhile, you've got your money, uh, you've stripped the equity out and it's sitting in a trust offshore. So debt is a very important strategy. I'm not talking about consumer debt, you know, credit card debt. No, those are all bad debts, but there's, there are plenty of good debt and, and equity stripping you know, is one of those. So on that note, um, I think I'm gonna stop there, Joe. I wanna make sure we leave a little time for Mike and q and I've probably already gone over. Um, you can quickly pass those pictures, people will see uh, the, the planning, uh, some of the people we're talking about, uh, the Hunt family and Silver, Elvis, the king of rock and roll, and examples of good planners and bad planners. And I wish I had more time to go through that. Um, and, and, and so on that note, uh, I hope I'll see some of you at the conference in, in Vegas. If you have questions, you know, please reach out to me if we don't, if we, we don't get them answered today. Um, and, and thank you again for inviting me to be on your show um, today, Joe. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you so much. That was very informative. And uh, I guess real fast before I switch it over to Mike, do you want to just quickly go over your conference or your um, special that you have for our viewers today? Well, we have a, we have a, a service called the Personal Asset Protection Plan. And what we do with that is we, uh, we give a, a analysis of your assets, your risk profile, your estate planning, your lifestyle goals and objectives, what you want to have happen with your money, both now and when you're no longer here. And we help you formulate a plan. Now, the, the, the $5,000 flat fee we charge for that, we do a lot of work. We, we um, issue a legal opinion to you that lays out all of the options that we believe are relevant to you uh, based on your criteria. But the real special that we're offering today for uh, your ECI development viewers is that when we finish the personal asset protection plan, and then we you know, finish the plan and move into the implementation stage, whatever that implementation stage is, it could be setting up a trust or setting up a, getting a second passport or you know, just setting up a foreign company or moving your IRA offshore, whatever it is, we will apply that $5,000 fee that we charge for the plan a second time towards the actual work product. We don't, we don't generally do that, uh, but Mike asked me to come up with something special for uh, the, um, for this program. So we're going to be offering that, you know, we'll, we'll extend that out for 30 days for anybody that contacts us and says that they um, are contacting us because of this ECI webinar. So we're very happy to do that. It makes, it makes the um, analysis and planning work free. Um, and um, I think a lot of people uh, are very happy to, to have that analysis done. So they really truly know on a personalized basis, what options make the most sense for them. So thank you. I forgot to put a plug in for myself. So I thank you for doing well, that. Thank you. For, thank you for that generous offer. And I do see that we are getting close to the hour, but um, you know, we want to quickly transition to how ECI can fit into your asset protection planning. And um, like my dad Great. said, we are going to bring on our special guest and CEO of ECI development, Mike Cobb. So Mike, if you unmute yourself, I will give you screen controls and um, then you can control. Very good. Thank you, Joe. And uh, also, uh, thanks, Joel. I, I appreciate you uh, staying up late tonight. Uh, I know it's probably about midnight. <laughs> Your body is on midnight time. Yep. So um, yes, anyway. Yes, it is. Yeah. So thank you. And, and also, uh, uh, thanks for the offer you've made. I know that, that a lot of folks do take advantage of the planning uh, and then move forward with, you know, some type of structuring or, or, or product or service. And, uh, and it, it's wonderful that you're offering to apply the, the planning fee towards that, that structuring and work that you do for the folks. So thank you for doing that as well. My um, pleasure. Yeah. Um, you know, it, you know, we are at the top of the hour and I'm not going to spend uh, very much time on this. Uh, I try to be respectful, but I also, you know, as Joel mentioned that the, uh, uh, he, he's on the defense, right? It, it's his job to make sure uh, that we have, uh, you know, we have the right defenses in place so we can, you know, we don't lose the battle. We're, you know, we, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do what we have to do to, to stay in business and, and, uh, and, and, and keep what's ours. You know, it, it's interesting because as the CEO of ECI Development, that's really been our philosophy. We've, we have now entered this month, October, uh, we have now entered our 25th year in business. And, and, and it's largely based on this type of, you know, of thinking, this philosophy that we're going to position ourselves so that we can stay in business for the long term. And, and yes, we've probably missed a few opportunities over the years to, to accelerate our growth by borrowing a lot of money or doing things that other companies have done. But 
you know, as I look around the conference rooms where I speak, uh, you know, literally, well, this year, not so much, but up until this year, you know, 30, 40 conferences a year, uh, it, there are almost no developers in, in the Central and South American region that have been around for 25 years. And, and it's, it's really this conservative posturing that has allowed us to stay in business and continue to serve clients as we have for now, you know, 20, 24 complete years. Uh, and, and, and because of this, one of the things that we've done as a strategy as a company is to look at what we call patient capital. Uh, we don't go out and borrow money because we don't know what the market's going to be like tomorrow. Um, and and we, we've done very good things with the company. We continue to serve hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clients and, and now have for, 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 for a long time. But the advantage to being this, this private company and being able to set our own destiny is that you know, we, we bring in shareholders. We bring in folks who want to be a part of a long-term company, see the value in what we're doing, and then deliver that value to consumers. And, and ultimately, as you can see in the third little bubble there, uh, take the company public. And, and we've been at this again a long time. Uh, we are now looking at a 2023 IPO. So three years from today, taking the company public for a very, very nice return for our shareholders. And that's, that, that's pretty exciting. Uh, we, we've done the foundational work. We've prepared ourselves to take the company public at, at many levels, from an asset standpoint, from a financial standpoint, from a proof of concept standpoint. All of these things have come together to allow us now to take the company public. And, and that's what the next three years are about. And so this capital raise that we are in the process of, of, of funding right now is to, to acquire three strategic properties, although one of the three is now in-house. Uh, so two new uh, strategic properties, and that's why we're raising money. And, and so, uh, you know, it, 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 it is, if it's something that you would like to consider further, you know, it, the timing is great for, uh, for you, and we'll talk about why that is in a second. Again, we're a regional company. We've been doing business in the region now for, for 24 years. We work across the region in, in very various levels of investment development. Yeah, and, and this is important because you know, there's different strokes for different folks. Not everybody wants to live at the beach. And even the people who wanna live at the beach, some wanna live on the Caribbean, some wanna live on the Pacific. But other folks wanna live in the mountains where it's springtime all the time. Some people wanna have a vineyard community. So all of these different elements we bring to bear and we offer these products to the consumer marketplace and we let the consumer decide where they want to own uh, their home overseas. The other thing about the diversification, it's not just in countries. Today we are seven neighborhoods, seven communities in four countries. That's what we've developed to date uh, with the additional uh, two countries coming online shortly but we also include our shareholders in all of our service businesses, whether it's the utilities, the rental and property management, and other types of service businesses that serve the consumers. Our shareholders are a part of that as well. The one last thing I think I wanna say, and we'll wrap this up and let Joe talk a little bit about a couple properties, is you know, many, many companies are a great idea but that's all they are. Maybe it's a, it's a biotech company or a high-tech company and, and they've got a great idea for something and, 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 and the idea has worth, but if the idea goes away, like let's say that you know, the, the founder of the company or the brains of the company, you know, that they leave or they, they, they get hit by a bus or whatever it is, the, the, the company collapses because it's, it's just an idea. The thing that I like about ECI, maybe more than anything else, and I hope you like it too, is that it's much more than an idea. Yes, ECI is an idea. It's a plan. It's a strategy. Uh, it has proof of concept. It's been working. Uh, our business plan is over 200 pages, and we, we would love for you to request a copy and read that, right? It is an idea. It's a powerful idea but it is also over 4,000 acres and five miles of beachfront property. Those are real, hard, tangible assets. And, and, you know, and, 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 and God forbid I get hit by a bus tonight, right? And I'm out of the picture. You know, as the leader of the company, the company would take a hit on that. But the assets are there. 
And that is fundamentally a very, very powerful reason that you may want to look at ownership of ECI. It is hard, tangible assets in four countries right now with ultimately six, seven, or even eight countries post IPO. Uh, some of the future assets, the vineyards, the highlands, something in Ecuador, all strategic assets. And again, looking at a team, looking at the people, it's again, it's not just an idea, it's a group of people. And, and yes, if I get hit by a bus tonight, the company will suffer, but there's a whole team of people that we've developed over a couple decades to, to carry forth this idea and these plans. Um, and, and again, so, so important to have the ability to execute on a great plan. So if you would like to own stock, We'd love to have you. Uh, you can own inside an IRA, a self-directed IRA. It's a great way to own shares of the company. When the company goes public, we're looking at a, a potential return of somewhere between six and 10 times the amount that you invest today. Uh, and uh, it actually gets a little bit better. We, we went out to our shareholders at the beginning of this year with a 350,000 share block at half off. Uh, we are raising money during this COVID time to take advantage of some properties and projects that are simply not going to make it out the back of this crisis. Uh, we, we learned our lesson in 2008, 2009. Yes, we survived it, but we didn't have cash in the bank to acquire some incredibly uh, inexpensive assets that we could have put on the books. Uh, this time we are ready. Uh, we, we went out to our shareholders. Shareholders had the first pick at the 350,000 shares. Uh, some of them remain. And if you're interested in owning stock in the company, you can own stock at $8.80 a share, which is half the current share price. So again, if this is something you would like to do, uh, please reach out to me, reach out to Joe, uh, let us know. We'll send you a copy of the executive summary. If you wanna dig in a little deeper, we'll send you the business plan, the PPM. Uh, we'll get on the phone together and see if an investment in ECI makes sense for you. Uh, Joe, I think we're going to turn this back over to you. You're going to talk a little awesome. bit about uh, a couple of the property options, uh, but but I would just segue with this last comment, and then I'm going to sign off. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's only a great investment in ECI if ECI serves consumers with what they want to own. And Joe is going to show now uh, what is absolutely smashing in the marketplace. This is a phenomenal product offering we've launched uh, across the region, across our platforms. Uh, it is being so well received. And uh, again, it, it's a product that consumers want to own. And because they want to own it, you know, it's, uh, it, it's creating incredible profit opportunities uh, for the company. So uh, Joe, take it away. But uh, Joel, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, Th thanks, Mike, for joining. It was really great to have you on, and thanks for talking about such a great opportunity. Um, you know, now we're going to transition a little bit. I know it's getting a little bit past the hour here, but you know, like Mike was talking about, you know, great opportunity that people are interested at the moment, and you know, couldn't be more so true with the tiny homes. Um, you know, as a property consultant, I talk to a lot of people, you know, every day about their interest, in, and it's been truly, truly awesome to see how many people are interested in tiny homes, and then also coupling it with you know, being off grid or, you know, environmentally conscious, which I think is an important thing to have in, in today's world. So here are some of the master plans of the different tiny homes in Belize at our uh, resort Grand Pacifica and as well in Panama. Um, so you can see that those different communities, you know, I'm not going to talk too much in detail because we've already done, you know, webinars about each of these individually. So if you'd like more information about those or if you'd like to request those webinars, send us an email at info at ecidevelopment.com and we'll get those to you. But just to give you some, some ideas of what they look like here, the renderings of the tiny homes in Belize, um, you can see that they're over water bungalows. Um, they also have the solar panels, so they're, you know, have that ability for the you know, solar, solar power, which is awesome. Uh, here is the recreational area for people to hang out. So if you're you know, tired of, of sitting in your tiny home and you wanna you know, enjoy the pool, the restaurant, all that stuff, you can do so you know, in the recreational area. Um, as well as a common palapa for people to hang out. So if you're having a party or, you know, depending on what you're going to do, you know, you can have a, a larger space to join. Or, you know, if there's health and wellness groups that want to do a yoga session, you know, you have those third party spaces that you can do so. Um, now, the tiny homes uh, at a resort in Grand Pacifica, you know, we're, 
in our first phase have 50 homes and we've already seen, uh, I think at the time, uh, over 35 people have reserved homes. So you know, it's been tremendous interest with those. Um, some more pictures of the common areas and what those will look like. You can see those um, really tremendous spaces if, if you're someone who can do work you know, digitally. Um, you, know, you just take out your laptop and you have great spaces that you can um, enjoy. Here are some uh, sample interior galleries. I know I'm, I'm going through this pretty fast, but like I said, we, we've done webinars on these. So please just request them at info at ecidevelopment.com and we'll get those over to you so you can go more in depth with, with these opportunities. And then lastly, the tiny homes in Panama. Um, you know, these are pretty new. We just actually had our soft launch the other week. Um, so not all the details have been finalized, but just to give you an idea, we can see here uh, when our team visited last year, you know, there's already orange groves on, on site as well as this great river. So there's a lot of great resources at the property. And this is um, in between Boquete and David in, in Panama. So it's a great property to add to our, you know, our previous inventory. So, um, you know, if you're someone who um, is interested in these tiny homes, you can see the, the different prices for, you know, in Belize, it's around 150. Um, at Grand Pacifica, you know, it's uh, just around 99,000. And then, you know, in Panama, 150 as well. You know, if you're someone who can't decide on one and you'd like to, you know, diversify, you can own, you know, all the tiny homes in the different locations to really get that diversity um, for under $400,000, which I think is, is truly a great opportunity. So um, just a few more things, uh, helpful considerations when, when looking at these, you know, we do accept cryptocurrencies. So if you're someone who has, you know, a good bit of those and are looking to you know, help diversify your, your assets, um, take a little off, you know, we, we can work with you there. Um, we also work with a bank um, called Key International Bank, C-A-Y-E, not, not K-E-Y. So, um, you know, if you're someone who would be interested in financing, you know, we do offer the, that as well. And then lastly, you know, my, my father talked a lot about, you know, residencies. We do do a lot with, you know, turnkey homes and residency solutions. So um, like he talked about in Panama, you know, you could make an investment there and then also qualify for residency. So having, you know, kind of two birds with one stone there is really, I think, a great option, um, you know, to have in your back pocket. So just a quick uh, recap of the ECI opportunities. Um, you know, we are recording this. So if I fly through this too fast, you know, please you know, get the recording and, and you're able to pause it at any point in time that you wish. But you can see the different tiny homes uh, in Belize, at Grand Pacifica and in Panama. Um, you know, if, if you're interested in, in doing all three, we are offering a webinar special of under 390,000. Um, so there's that as well as the stocks that Mike was talking about. Um, and if you would like any more information about any of those opportunities, please, like I said, send an email to info at ecidevelopment.com at the bottom of the screen there, and we'll get back to you um, with anything you're requesting. And then just a quick recap of, of you know, my, my father's opportunities. If you have any questions and, and would like to get in touch with him specifically, please email nagalaw at ecidevelopment.com and uh, you can either get some of those free reports or um, that special that he has put forth to our audience. Um, just make sure you mention Nagel ECI in, in your email to him. That way he can know that you know, you're one of our viewers and make sure you get that discount that, that he talked about. So dad, maybe real fast, um, you know, you could chime in a little bit about the conference that you guys are hosting coming up here. Sure, happy to do it. And, and again, I apologize for um, my comments running so long. I, I guess um, maybe my, I don't know if my mouth isn't working as quickly or my brain's not working as quickly as it should be at this time of the day, but um, yeah. So Las Vegas this year, um, my firm holds once a year, a asset protection and global investment conference. Uh, it's really my A-list. I invite really the top people from around the world that I interface with, uh, whether it's lawyers, accountants, bankers, real estate people, gold. I, I really have a whole um, you know spectrum of, of great speakers. This year we'll have a lot of extra political speakers because of the election, sort of interpreting the election for us. And for the first time ever, we're gonna do this conference in the United States. Uh, the first 23 years, we've held it in Belize, we've held it in Turks and Caicos, we've, we've held it in Switzerland, we've held it in Austria. We really held it in a lot of different uh, interesting places. Uh, but this year, uh, it's just, it's very difficult for a lot of people to move around internationally uh, because of the coronavirus. But Las Vegas, you know, it's open for business. 
Uh, we're staying at a JW Marriott, which has the um, really the highest uh, sanitary conditions possible. They, you know, they'll have a lot of social distancing. They'll have a lot of, um, you know, places for you to um, have you make sure your hands are clean and, and things like that all the time. You're not going to be sitting too close to anyone. We're very limited on the number of people that can attend in person. So if you want to attend in person, you know, let us know right away uh, because those spots will be gone for sure. Um, in addition to the in-person uh, option, we will have a virtual option. It's going to be uh, videotaped and, and it will be live streamed. And for those people, you know, they can get the uh, videos and watch it whenever they want. They can watch it real time with all the participants and they can participate in the Q&A and, and things like that and feel like they're part of the conference even without traveling to Las Vegas. So if you're interested in either of those, let us know. Uh, we'd love to have you there. It's, uh, it's four days. It's a very uh, intense uh, deep dive into the, these topics. Um, and we, we also try to help you put the offense and the defense together. I mean, I'm talking about structures. You have somebody like Mike Cobb talking about, you know, real estate investments, but, you know, how can you hold the real estate investment inside your structure? How can you make you know, international investments, you know, and put them in your IRA? We really try to help you go from, you know, from A to Z uh, with that. And we have really some of the top speakers. Uh, Egon von Greiritz is one of the world's talking heads uh, on, on gold. He's going to be um, speaking to us. He's with a company called uh, uh, Matterhorn Asset Management in Switzerland. Uh, we have really speakers from all over. So I hope you'll I hope you'll join us. And thanks for uh, putting the extra Joel, plug in on that, Joey. Joel, Joe, let, let me just jump in. One of the things that so many people have said who have attended this conference, and, and I think I've, I've spoken at all but one of them, Joel, I think one time I missed it for some reason, but for, for every other, uh, every other 20, this will be, uh, this will be my 23rd out of 24. But, you know, one of the things that I hear said more often than anything else about this particular conference is, is it really is two things. One, uh, you, you can go with an idea or a concept in your head and you can leave with a plan of action. Uh, you know, all the meals are taken together, breakfast, lunch, dinner, cocktail parties, any events that happen are all the attendees and all of the speakers. And so if you say, well, gosh, you know, that, that Nagel guy, he had a great idea, but I'd like to learn a little bit more about it. So you can grab him and say, let's have dinner together tonight or meet, let's have lunch tomorrow or sit, sit with me at breakfast or whatever it is. And so you have immediate and full-time access to, like you said, some of the, some of the top speakers. I mean, Mark Skousen is gonna be there, right? And, and, and in person, and you've got you know, a few folks uh, who are coming in virtually as well. Uh, you know, and, and, and these, these types of people would be hard to get, get an appointment with, first of all, but let alone spend any kind of quality time with, get to know them. So when you leave, you will have a Rolodex. And if you want a plan, you will leave with a plan. That, that, that has been resounding uh, uh, to me from the other participants over the years. The other thing that I think sometimes gets swept under the rug, and, and I would say it's a soft benefit at least on the front end, I'm not sure if it's truly a soft benefit. Uh, you know, w one of one of the uh, very early President's Week attendees said, "I love coming to President's Week because when I have an idea about something, instead of everybody telling me why it won't work, everyone gets excited and tries to figure out how we could do whatever it is this idea is. It's a different kind of philosophy." It's, it's a group of people who really get it, who, who are entrepreneurial at heart generally, uh, who are doers and achievers. And when you put 25, 30, 40, up to 49 this year, you know, 49 doers and achievers in a room together, it is powerfully awesome. And, and, and that network that you come out with uh, is, is, again, it's a soft benefit if you, you, know, if you look at it that way. Long term, I think it's it's a pretty powerful reason that a lot of people have come back to President's Week, you know, many many times over the years, uh, and 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 so I think if if it's something people are thinking about as a concept, what they're going to find is come for the asset protection, you know, that 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 general content piece, you're going to leave with a lot more than you you bargained for because um, it's uh, 
it's it's a powerful awesome event to have that many tremendous people all together for you know for four and a half days uh so anyway that that's it on that note and joe you've got thank you Q&A thank you after. mike you did a you did a much better hmm. um commercial for the conference than i did so thank you and, and if you'd like to you know learn more about registration for that you know send us an email at info at ecidevelopment.com and um, we can help you out there. Um, like Mike said, we, we do have Q&A coming up, but I know we are a good bit you know, after uh, the hour here. So you know, I want to make sure we do get your questions answered properly and, and to how you, you'd like. So um, you know, if it's something that's related to asset protection, you have that, that email contact information on the left, nagel at ecidevelopment.com. Um, and if it's something property or stock related, um, please send us an email at info or info at ecidevelopment.com and we'll make sure to get those questions answered for you. But, um, you know, dad, do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to um, end with here before we, before we end? No, I, again, I apologize for taking so long and, and not really having a lot of time to, to do your questions. I'd stay on, but I know you have a, a strict uh, uh, hard stop and you want to keep it to a certain amount of time. So please, if, if you, you know, if you'd like, you know, send a question to me. I'll make sure in the next, you know, day or two or three that I answer all the questions I get. So I'll make that uh, commitment to to answer everybody's questions that way. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining. And Mike, I don't know if you're still on, but thank you as well for joining. And for everyone that uh, attended, that you know, really thank you a lot. Um, Ivan as well for for all your back uh, background work as well. That was very awesome. So thank you so much for joining, and uh, we will talk to you guys next time. Take care now.